Good afternoon. My name is Martha Tropi, and I'm the acting director of the Public Sector Innovation Team at the Canada School of Public Service. Bienvenue à la sixième activité de la série sur les nouveaux enjeux économiques, un partenariat entre l'École de la fonction publique du Canada et le Centre pour l'innovation dans le gouvernement, gouvernance internationale. I want to acknowledge all the hard work of CG's Managing Director and General Counsel, Aaron Schull, and that of his colleagues for all they have done to help the school organize this session and the New Economy Series overall. We want to thank Aaron and CG for our continued partnership as we work together to deliver high-quality content to the public service. Je tiens à mentionner certains points administratifs importants avant de commencer. La traduction simultanée est offerte dans la langue de votre choix par entreprise du portail. Des directives à cet effet, de même que le texte est exposé aujourd'hui, vous ont été envoyés en même temps que le lien de la web division. Les participants sont invités à soumettre leurs questions pour la période de questions avec modérateur qui a lieu à la fin de la séance. Vous pouvez également les soumettre ou, vo ou voter pour votre question favorite en moins du système de web diffusion, en cliquant sur la main située dans le coin de votre écran. With the housekeeping out of the way, I'd like to introduce you to today's panelists. Keith Jansa is the executive director of the CIO Strategy Council. He works with Canada's most forward-thinking public and private sector CIOs to collectively address the pace of digital transformation and advance Canada's position in the global digital economy. In his previous role as Vice President of Standards and Innovation, Keith provided executive leadership in the design and successful accreditation of the Council's standard-setting process to drive the creation of national standards to advance Canada's digital economy. Michel Gerard is a senior fellow at CG, where he contributes expertise in the area of standards for big data and AI. His research strives to drive dialogue of what standards are and why they matter in the emerging sectors of the economy and how to incorporate them into regulatory and procurement frameworks. And finally, Marta Yancharski is a sector specialist for AI and big data at the Standards Council of Canada. In this role, she provides strategic advice and support for Canadian innovators in becoming involved in the standardization as a way to engage markets competitively. She serves government entities with advice and updates them on standards landscapes, and she brings diverse Canadian stakeholders together to discuss and coordinate priority issues in the sector. In addition to being a panelist today, Marta will also be moderating the session and keeping an eye on time and asking questions. Over to you, Marta. Thank you, Martha, and uh, thank you, CG and uh, CSPS, for hosting this event and this dialogue. I'm really excited to be in a discussion with Michelle and Keith. And I think um, to kick things off, the three of us will have a short presentation to give some context and background to the organizations that we're coming from and our views on the standards landscape. And with that, I would ask that the uh, first presentation for Standards Council of Canada be shared. Perfect. Um, so yes, uh, as a moderator and a bit of a panelist here, uh, my name is Marty Ancharski, the Sector Specialist for AI um, and Big Data at Standards Council of Canada. Um, and if I could just ask for the next slide, please. Thank you. Standards Council of Canada is the custodian of consensus build standards in Canada, providing international participation for Canadians to ISO, IEC, and JTC1, ensuring robust domestic uh, standards development and providing conformity assessment accreditation, bringing together stakeholders uh, to support Canadian innovation. Standards development provides three main key things. They support efficient development of the new and emerging sectors. They foster trust among stakeholders and developers, and they advance safe and reliable systems and practices. There are opportunities for Canadians' voices to be able to participate and empower their expertise in standard development. Next slide, please. Thank you. SCC has a really good relationship with AI and, and big data Canadian stakeholders, from academic to research institutions, as well as prominent industry leaders. We can provide a unique, wholesome view on the intersection of standards development, federal government programs, as well as technology development. We understand the needs that these stakeholders have. Our engagement with the superclusters has resulted in unique standardization strategies to support their work in innovative sector, 
by providing them with the necessary support to embed their expertise into standards development initiatives. Most recently, SCC has participated in the Riyadh International Standards Summit, where it explored the role of standards in crisis management and accelerating the global digital transformation. Countries, including Canada, agreed on a call for action for international standardization bodies such as ISO, IEC, ITU, and the G20 countries to work more closely together in recognizing, developing, and adopting international standards to fast forward global digital transformation, facilitate trade, ICT, and innovation. Next slide, please. To dive a little more into what we do, one of the things that SEC performs is it accredits third-party certification bodies, taking direction from ISO and IEC guidelines to ensure that they operate in a consistent and reliable manner. Furthermore, SEC ensures that accredited certification bodies meet regulatory needs. There are many such bodies in Canada, and I'm sure you might recognize some of these logos on the slide. As such, quality and safety are ensured in countless products, programs, and services as they certify to standards. Next slide, please. Uh, secondly, the SEC also accredits standards development organizations, allowing them to develop national standards. Organizations that demonstrate a thorough standards development process based on consensus building from diverse stakeholders and implements a maintenance cycle for published standards, among other criteria, can be accredited. We presently have 12 accredited standard development organizations, and they vary in scope and sector, such as plumbing and building standards to healthcare delivery and emerging technologies and IT, as well as government support through the SDO of CGSB. Next slide, please. Standards, while voluntary, have a deep relationship with regulations. They are a fantastic tool to help guide stakeholders in compliance to regulations, as well as pursue international harmonization and mutual agreement through direct embedding of standards. Over 5,000 standards are currently referenced in Canadian regulation, and that number continues to grow. International standards are the largest group type of standards being referenced, with an increase in 18% over the last six years. Furthermore, particularly in the ICT and emerging sectors, international standards are the most often referenced in Canada at 59.2%. Next slide, please. National standard development has also been quite busy, with 435 national standards published so far this fiscal year. We have noticed that while domestic standard development has been gradually growing, as you can see here on the chart, the majority of standards developed are an adoption of international standards. Next slide, please. Thank you. The SEC is supporting and ensuring that Canadians can participate in international standard development, as it is clear that the impact of these standards is far-reaching, not only domestically, but around the world. We have two programs in particular, the Innovation Program and the IP Program, that work individually with Canadian stakeholders to ensure that the Canadian voice and innovation are captured by standardization initiatives. Since 2018, we have had over 350 new standardization participants that have joined the standardization system from government, industry, and academia. The standard, Canada's innovation and skills highlight, plan highlights the value of standard setting in advancing Canada's economic interests and growing globally successful companies. By working directly with Canadian innovators, SCC is providing tailored end-to-end -end support to companies in developing effective standardization strategies to accelerate commercialization and remove barriers to uh, the adoption of new Canadian technologies. SCC has a working, sorry, we're still on the other one. Thank you. Um, SCC has a working relationship with several federal and provincial partners working to support the federal government's vision for Canada. I'd like to showcase a few examples from different areas where SCC has been able to provide support. Next slide, please. Thank you. The World Council of City Data is a Canadian organization that is looking to standardize the way city data is handled at a municipal level and also how cities are able to interact with each other. Through SCC support in the innovation program, a suite of standards that defines and establishes indicators to measure the performance of cities, services, and quality of life are being developed. 
This is an example wherein, through the support of one stakeholder, the diverse representation of vested stakeholders in the area of city data are involved. Next slide, please. One of the areas of interest and innovation, of course, in Canada's quantum computing and its application to today's technology. Through the innovation program at SEC, we have been able to support and guide a Canadian innovator, Isara, in the sector to lead the development of international quantum safe cryptography standards. As Canadian stakeholders, both government and industry, looking at the level of privacy and protection their data needs and how this will look with the adoption of quantum applications, it is important for Canadians to be active in contributing how the landscape will be shaped. Next slide, please. So one of the main initiatives that we have been working on in the past year is the Canadian Data Governance Standardization Collaborative, launched in May 2019 as a cross-sector coordinating body with the objective to accelerate the development of industry-wide data governance standardization strategies. It's led by co-chairs Anil Arora, Canada's chief statistician, and Philip Dawson, the public policy lead at Element AI. The collaborative is not tasked with developing standards. Its role is to articulate needs, propose coordinated standardization activity, minimize duplication of effort, and enable stakeholders to focus their resources in this effort. The one overarching task is to accelerate the development of industry-wide data governance standardization strategies that are consistent with stakeholder needs and facilitate the growth of data governance capabilities in line with national and global priorities. As a consensus builder and facilitator of the standardization system, the SEC has, through this collaborative, four principal tasks. Identify Canadian priority areas for data governance that might benefit from standardization, including areas of particular interest to individual Canadians. Conduct an environmental scan, gap analysis, and catalog stakeholder needs. Deliver a comprehensive and consensus-based roadmap describing the current and desired Canadian standardization landscape including recommendations to address gaps and new areas where standards and conformity assessment are needed. And finally, propose national and international standardization initiatives and recommend the appropriate timelines and organizations that can perform the work. This collaborative has seen very active participation from government and regulator stakeholders, providing collaborative area to learn about Canadian needs, as well as opportunities for standards adoption. Next slide, please. We have had a lot of Canadian leadership in international standards development, particularly in the International Committees for IT, JTC1, and Artificial Intelligence, as well as in data committees. In the Committee for AI, a Canadian is leading the work under Working Group 1 for foundational standards in the position of convener. This includes oversight of work around the standards for terminology, concepts, AI lifecycle, and the AI management system standard, areas of identified interest to regulators. In addition, there have been two standards proposed by the Canadian Mirror Committee that have been voted on positively by the International Committee are currently under development. The first is a technical specification, assessment for classification performance for machine learning models. This proposal was developed by a researcher from Vector Institute. And secondly is the conformity assessment standard, artificial intelligence management system standard, which was developed in consensus with the Canadian Mirror Committee and has received unanimous consent from the international community. In the area of data, Canadians are hard at work at the new standard being developed in the Committee for Data Integration and Management, SC32, looking at the data usage broadly, as well as the e-commerce applications. Next slide, please. So I wanted to take a minute to have a closer dive at the Artificial Intelligence Management System standard. It is a critical step in the maturation of the artificial intelligence sector. This standard provides requirements and guidance for establishing, implementing, maintaining, and continually improving an artificial intelligence management system within the context of an organization. It is applicable to any organization, regardless of size, type, and nature, which provides or uses products and services using artificial intelligence. Its ISO number will be ISO 42001. This standard will have a similar impact as the management system standard developed for cybersecurity, ISO 27001, which the CyberCAN Secure program is based on. These management system standards are the sector-specific adoptions of ISO 9001. 
Conformity assessment schemes that are based on standards with explicit criteria developed in a consensus-based collaborative manner serve as a vehicle to ensure values such as human rights, accountability, and transparency are maintained. Not only did Canada propose this standard, but Canadians have been elected into leadership positions for its development. And we highly encourage anyone who's interested in working on the development of the standard and detailing the controls it should include to reach out to us to join the Canadian New York Committee. Next slide, please. Um, finally, I'd like to also recommend one of the other pilot projects that we have on the go. In partnership with ISED, SCC is coordinating a conformity assessment pilot for AI. This will create the partnership groundwork for a full-scale program. The first of these three phases has been launched a month ago. The first phase delivers a prototype conformity assessment program for sandbox testing. AI small medium enterprise developers along with regulators and conformity assessment bodies will participate in the prototype development. This will create the partnership groundwork for the final program to be delivered in stage three. Stakeholders are being identified from three main groups, regulators, conformity assessment bodies, and innovators, SME developers. Should any member be interested in learning more about this pilot, please feel free also to reach out to us. And with that, to my last slide, As your trusted federal partner, please feel free to reach out to us. My colleagues and I cover a suite of stand uh, sectors and we would be happy to engage with you. Whether it's to learn more about the current standards landscape in a particular area or topic, or explore opportunities to participate in standards development, or on how to promote innovation through standardization in your programs and program proposals, please feel free to reach out. We are happy for a discussion. Um, and with that, I will conclude my presentation and we will move on to the next speaker. Thank you, Marta, for uh, outlining uh, the role and activities uh, that Standards uh, Council uh, undertakes uh, on behalf of Canada. That's very uh, interesting to see the progress that Standards Council is, uh, is, is making uh, in the new areas. Um, if we want to go to the next slide, um, thank you. I wanted to um, uh, basically step back um, over the next 10 to 12 minutes uh, with our audience to um, basically go back to some of the basics that um, you know some of you may appreciate um, uh, learning from, um, so so that we we start from the same uh, I guess the same page when we go to to questions and interventions. So. I want to cover four areas this, this afternoon. Uh, the first one is obviously, you know, redefining what standards are. I think it's important for us to um, to get to the basics on that. I want to talk to uh, to you about standards in uh, in regulations. Uh, we know that uh, you know uh, regulators uh, use standards and safety codes uh, across government departments and agencies. So I want to want to talk about that a little bit. I want to talk about standards in trade, and Marta alluded to it, and 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 Keith will obviously talk about it as well. There's such a, cor a strong correlation between our success nationally in setting standards and in our trade, uh, you know, the success of our trade portfolio. So I want to talk to you about that. And then the fourth uh, item uh, for for me will be standards in innovation, which is critical if we want to. Um, you know, if we want to make sure that our Canadian values are reflected in, in a bunch of normative documents that will have an impact on our lives uh, and, and our democracy. So let's go to the next slide and, and go back to, to our to the basics here. Um, S'il vous plaît, next slide. There you go. So standards, no, uh, let's go to the previous one. I'm sorry, we have a little bit of a delay here. What are standards? Thank you. So, I mean, standards keep the economy running. They they cover almost anything you touch and use in your house, from electrical outlets to plumbing, or elevators, or pressure vessels, um, propane, uh, you name it. Uh, if, if there is a product that you use on an ongoing basis, chances are that it's been uh, standardized. Um, and if you if you use uh, products in a supply chain or if you use complex products, uh, it's going to serve as a handshake between components of a product so that uh, supply chains actually work properly. 
Um, so so you, you have lots of standards being used that you don't even know, uh, you know, exist, but, but yet if they weren't there, you'd be uh, having, a, you'd have a lot of trouble going through your day. Um, standards allow for interoperability, obviously. So if you use your cell phone in China versus uh, Indonesia, it's going to work. Uh, if without standards, you know, 10, 15 years ago, uh, we were kind of stuck. We had to change SIM cards and whatnot. So, you know, when standards are kind of behind you or, or behind technology, it creates also uh, problems for people. So it's, it's, it's important to, to keep the standards agenda in line with technology deployment agenda so that um, we, we actually can enjoy new technologies uh, around the world quicker. Um, obviously, standards, you know, play a very important role in health and safety. That's probably the main reason why they were designed in Canada in the 1940s and 50s. Um, you know, as, as the economy was growing, as, you know, oil and gas and electrical products were being introduced, uh, there were health and safety issues associated with those products. And, and we needed a whole bunch of standards and codes uh, to ensure not only interoperability, but to ensure that these products were safe as, as they were being, uh, you know, developed and deployed. And, and on that front, we, we had a, a number of national associations, you know, engineers and uh, uh, oil and gas specialists and, and others uh, on the healthcare sector, it was the same. Basically, national associations deciding what we need to have a view on standards. We need to figure out what's important versus what's not important. And national associations in, in, in Canada uh, played a very important role in, in basically designing the standards agenda in a tangible economy. And we're seeing the same thing happening with the intangible products, the, the new things that, uh, you know, that we use on a daily basis with, with uh, websites and applications and AI and whatnot. So it's important to keep in mind that, you know, as, as, we, as our economy moves from a, a world of, of, you know, mainly tangible products to a world where there's a balance between tangible and intangible products, standards are as important. And the main re reason why we need standards in, in the world of intangibles is that once a standard is developed, it, it really brings the cost down of the unit. I mean, you go from, you know, a situation where you have very large integrated firms having control over the entire chain to a world where a whole bunch of organizations can compete. So, so with interoperability stand, standards out there, you can get your SMEs to compete globally. They know what to do and they know how to integrate their parts or, or, or components into global supply chains. So it applies for intangibles as well. Next slide, please. I will leave that with you in, in terms of, uh, you know, given the time is of the essence, there is a process to develop standards. Um, it needs, you know, all voices at the table. It is a, a process that is deliberative. It is consensus based. It can be time consuming um, for, for some, but it's kind of important to have it uh, done properly so that you have agreement. Uh, once you have a draft standard, you have agreement amongst uh, all stakeholder groups who participate in the dialogue so that uh, the document once published is seen as something that is credible and is seen as, as something that can be used by all parties. So um, it's important to have a, 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 a credible process to develop standards. And once a standard is developed, well, you need to update it uh, every five years or sometimes in the case of safety codes every three years so that it um, reflects new technologies being introduced. Let's go to the next slide. Standards and regulations, very briefly, let's go to the next one. Uh, we know regulators, whether at the federal level or at the, or at the provincial level, routinely use standards and safety codes, uh, incorporating them into their regulations. Uh, Marta mentioned more than 5,000 references to standards. If you add you know, the electrical code and the building code and all of the other codes that are necessary to keep our, our country running and safe, you're probably talking about tens of thousands of different standards being incorporated. Um, and, um, you know, regulators uh, at the federal level are, um, you know, there's probably 1,400 different standards used at the federal level. So, so my advice to you, policy advice to you as regulators, is let's make sure that, that you're aware of new standards that are being developed if you are to regulate a new technology. Um, if you have a new technology, 
that you consider regulating and you don't see a standard, there's a problem here. So you probably need to reach out to SCC so that you can figure out what's the best way to, to create a normative document that industry can use to comply with your, you know, the intent of your regulation. Um, and then, you know, focus on third-party certification of the of the product that is being designed, so that uh, you have a demonstration uh, of, of health and safety. Last advice for regulators: It's uh, we've seen it before. Is, is we want to see the, the most up-to-date version of a standard in your regulation. We want, uh, you know, uh, ambulatory references in regulation, so that. Um, uh, standards stay up to date, and then we can align uh, standards between, uh, you know, regulatory agencies across the country or around the world. Uh, the, the principle here is can, kind of um, simple to understand. It's one standard, one test. Once there's a standard out there, we'd like to have it apply across the world, and we'd like to have it, uh, you know, the tests and the certification recognized around the world too, so that we, we keep uh, our competitiveness uh, up there as opposed to create unnecessary barriers for industry. Let's go to the next slide, please. Nas necessary complementary regulation. I've talked to you about this. Uh, when I was at Standards Council, uh, we've seen so many uh, new technologies being deployed that would need to be regulated and then saw standards development bodies respond to this, whether it's hoverboard or, or you know, cannabis. Uh, it's it's uh, hydrogen. It's it's everywhere. So um, I, I think there's no um, you know there's no um, preconditions for regulators to basically get engaged and involved in standardization. It does not require a huge expertise uh, about the standard system to 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 get involved. Um, it is a, a user friendly process. Um, there are no barriers for regulators to ask questions and get engaged. So I would encourage regulators to really think about standards as a tool in your toolbox uh, going forward, whether it's an existing technology or a new one that's going to be deployed. Next slide, please. Standards and trade, let, the trade. Let's go to the next slide. I want to uh, share with you a few points about standards and trade. Um, this dates back to a couple of years ago, uh, you know, more than 1 million different domestic standards out there, uh, a growing number of international standards. Every, you know, every year we see tens of thousands of new standards being published. So there are a lot of standards being developed. And, and the question for Canada is to decide when can we afford to be a standards taker, and that is not invest any resources and adopt uh, an international standard as is once it's deployed or developed versus when do we have to become standard setters and make a difference and ensure that our viewpoint or our expertise or our commercial uh, interests are being reflected. Let's go to the next slide, please. So two things that I'd like you, you know, take home messages for you, uh, as you as you finalize this session today. The first one is that standards are not neutral. This is not the United Nations. You have very different bodies developing standards, and they only reflect the views of those who will invest the time and the resources at the table to develop the standard. If you're not there, you know, as we say in French, les absents ont toujours tort. So if you're not there, it will not reflect your, your, your priorities or your technologies or your IP for that matter. So standards are not neutral. Uh, if it makes a difference in, in your business or in your regulatory area, then you have to participate. Otherwise, nobody's going to have a voice on your behalf. Let's go to the next slide. And then the second key message I'd like you to remember out of the presentation today is once the standard is set, chances are that the die is cast. It's very rare that we see standards being completely upended from the first edition to the second edition. So all of the key issues, whether it's the uh, intellectual property embedded in the document, um, some of the interoperability component uh, decided, uh, the minimum quality requirements or the safety requirements. Once this is done during the first edition, the die is cast. So there is an, uh, you know, an interest uh, on the part of those um, you know, on, uh, commerce or regulators, you know, to to think through those two issues. If the standard is not neutral, 
And once it's done, it doesn't reflect your needs, then you're kind of stuck with it. So um, we've seen instances where, you know, Canada has won big by being a standard setters and other instances where Canada had to adjust and, and sometimes having, you know, pretty dire consequences on the economy because we could not live with the decisions that were made at the standards committee table. Next slide, please. I want to talk to you very briefly about, uh, you know, what we're competing against. Um, China was nowhere to be seen internationally before 2010. And they began in 2010 to really take up uh, a lot of uh, space internationally uh, because they believe that standards are important for trade, important to, uh, you know, to assert uh, basically their economic power. And we've seen them, let's go to the next slide, going from, uh, you know, very, very small participation to extremely important participation uh, in uh, internationally. This is an example from ISO, the International Organization from Standardization. Uh, China now is, you know, nipping at the heel of uh, France, the UK, uh, the United States uh, in terms of chairing technical committees. They're displacing Canadians left, right and center in terms of chairmanship. So we have to fight back and we are. But, you know, let's not forget that, um, you know, those who control the hold the pen control the development of the normative documents. And we're seeing China really becoming uh, active on that front. Um, can we go to the next slide? Uh, just to conclude on that with China, you're going to be seeing in, in the coming weeks a, a new document from China. It's going to be called China Standards 2035. And it's going to be their master plan, basically, to uh, systematically occupy the territory internationally when it comes to standardization uh, in existing and new areas, including AI and big data, 5G and whatnot. So um, uh, in China, there is a belief that... Um, you know, uh, third uh, third tier companies uh, make products, uh, second tier companies uh, make technologies, and first tier or first class companies make standards. That's understood in China and it's being applied across the board. Uh, and with this new strategy that they're coming up with, we're gonna be facing a formidable adversary on the standards front. So we need to figure out where we're gonna be going to protect our interests from a regulatory perspective, but also a trade perspective. Uh, let's go to the next slide. I want to talk a little bit about uh, standards and trade uh, very briefly. Uh, this is uh, from, uh, again, a couple of years ago. We, you know, we have less than 44,000 exporters of products uh, in Canada. Let's go to the next slide. Um, we rely on them for our GDP, but uh, what we're seeing is that the vast majority of these companies only export to one country, and that's the U.S. Um, and, and as a result, we're seeing tens of thousands of Canadians participating in U.S. standards bodies. Um, uh, it seems to be the way to go if you are in a new business in a tangible world. But the, in the intangible, intangible world, in new technologies, we have to think broader than the U.S. Let's go to the next slide. And 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 I think the, the stats when it comes to uh, the value of exports show us that there is a direct correlation, right, between whether you export to one country or more and, and, the, and, and what you bring back to Canada. And, and what we're seeing is that, again, there's only 800 companies in the country exporting to 20 countries or more. And they bring in, you know, they bring home the bacon when it comes to the share of export value. So if I have advice for, for folks at the federal level, you know, think about standards as a vehicle to help Canadian innovative companies access global markets. This is what we want. We, are, we want more of that. More companies that become standard setters. And, and 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 basically focus on uh, you know all continents as opposed to only the U.S. as they as they design their uh, their strategies. Very quickly, then standards and innovation. Uh, next slide, please. Critical again. If you are a federal regulator, you will find so many different bodies now that are developing standards for. Uh, the new economy, um, and uh, it is mind-boggling to see, but it, it doesn't mean that because it's complex that we shouldn't play. So we need to figure out what is the landscape out there in emerging technologies, 
who is developing the standards. It, it may be under the surface, just under the radar, but, but they're still making the right decisions that will help Canadian companies access the markets or will basically set them aside. So uh, please remember uh, that standards are as important in the intangible economy as, as they were for the tangible economy. Last slide. So my advice to you is, is whether or not you were exposed to standards before, I think you, you, you need to uh, give it a try and think about helping your stakeholders, helping industry, helping provinces move to a Canadian view. Uh, we need strong Canadian delegations, whether they participate nationally in the US or internationally. We need a strong Canadian view so we understand our interests and we know in what instances we need and we must become standard setters uh, in order to make a difference. Um, and, you know, thinking about new technologies, I just give you an example here. We know uh, five years from now we'll have 5G in this country. We don't know who's going to be operating that 5G, um, but we know there are issues associated with it. So, so why not think outside the box a little bit? And, and come up with a, you know, a 5D safety code so that health and safety and interoperability and cybersecurity are addressed in one handbook, one document that would allow all uh, players, big and small, to participate uh, in, the, in, in the development and the deployment of that foundational technology for the future. You know, the sky, the sky is the limit. Well, all we have to do is to think through you know, what's the landscape out there in terms of standardization and decide when we have to play big, then then let's just move it uh, and uh, and get going because we have a good reputation uh, internationally. Um, so with that, I will leave uh, the, uh, the, the table to, uh, to Keith to present um, his case study when it comes to the ICT world. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you. Michelle. Um, so uh, hello everyone and uh, certainly uh, a thank you to CG and the Canada School of Public Service for inviting me uh, today. I'll share another perspective with you and a few uh, of the other facets on standards that uh, as a public service you may find uh, beneficial to, and to be mindful of. Uh, if we can go to the, the next slide. Um, so it looks like we're having some some difficulty with the uh, the slides. Um, uh, if we can go to the next slide, just to see if it's a reoccurring issue. Um, all right. So um, perhaps it might be beneficial um, for for me to control the slides. Unfortunately. Um, I don't know if that's possible. All right. Um, apologies for the uh, for the delay. I will go about sharing. In the interim, I'd like to remind viewers um, that they can submit questions on the top right of the viewing uh, window, and uh, we'll be able to get into them after this presentation. Appreciate that, Martha. Uh, all right, so I'm just moving over. Uh, all right, so... Um, getting oriented again apologies all right so again my focus here today will be uh, providing another perspective uh, to share with you and and uh, a couple of other facets to consider um, so consider this new and emerging technologies are opening doors to exciting opportunities um, but they also introduce a myriad of risks to preserving a public trust in the wake of growing privacy concerns over the potential for the misuse of personal data. Uh, consider that data collection and use has proliferated at alarming speeds with the launch of online platforms, smart devices, and everything Internet of Things. The need to ensure the responsible use of data and AI, quite frankly, has never been has never been greater. And so AI is commonly identified as one of three game-changing 
technologies in the horizon, blockchain and Internet of Things being the others, some of which I'm sure those, uh, those with us today are, are uh, currently uh, contemplating of and addressing. Uh, its potential impacts on the labor market alone mark it as uh, a keen interest to public, private and not-for-profit sectors. Furthermore, given the rapid escalation and cyber mischief and malicious practices from both public and private players globally, it is important to put some stakes in the ground to guide well-intentioned, uh, to guide the well-intentioned and to potentially sanction those with other motives. So if we consider artificial intelligence technologies, just as an example, there are significant governance questions around AI that must be thoughtfully addressed up front to ensure that the technology developed and used with is with, used within a socially acceptable frame. Experience suggests, however, that early leadership can quickly be eroded without interventions aimed at strengthening early markets and facilitating commercialization. To maintain effective leadership and fully leverage the benefits of this technology over time, it is essential to set standards that can drive behaviors in markets within which technolo technological expertise can, can then thrive. So standards, as we've heard both from, from Marta and Michelle, are an effective mechanism for demonstrating compliance with processes a community agrees are important. Broad adoption of standards reduces the uncertainty and therefore can encourage entrepreneurship and investment. Consider this, as part of Tr uh, President Trump's executive order on maintaining American leadership in artificial intelligence in February 2019, the United States is driving the development of technical standards for the safe testing and deployment of AI technologies across industry. The government's executive department and agencies are pursuing six strategic objectives in furtherance of both promoting and protecting American advancements in AI, one of which being to ensure that technical standards minimize vulnerability to attacks from malicious actors and reflect federal priorities for innovation, public trust, and public confidence in systems that use AI technologies, and to further develop international standards to promote and protect those priorities. So the question is, is what's behind the motivations of a president, the head of state, the head of a government to bolster standards? And so that's where I'd like to dive in. As we've heard, standards are in everything. They're more than guiding principles from the smallest screw thread to the most complex utility network. Standards prevent harm, ensure reliability, and generally improve our way of life. They are essential to spearheading technology advancement, innovation, and trade. At their core, standards allow us to establish accepted practices, technical requirements, and modernize at times complex policies. Without standards, we would have no benchmarks for success, no product safety security, no common technology unifying global markets, and certainly no opportunity for competition to thrive. Take cellular communication, for example. From, 4G, uh, from 3G to 4G and now into 5G technology, standards have ensured expanded connectivity, improved security, and enhanced energy savings. Because mobile standards are in place, we are all able to connect seamlessly to our families when we're abroad or uh, when we are at home. And that's no accident. They are a fail-safe that allow Canadian companies to compete at home and abroad. They are vital to both business growth and security, especially in our ever-changing, fast-paced global digital economy that's showing no signs of slowing. Each standard has an intended purpose, from facilitating business interactions and providing interoperability to demonstrating due diligence or regulatory compliance. From performance-based product specifications to management system standards, helping organizations improve quality, security, and reliability, standards can be developed as early as an idea. They can begin to codify common nomenclature and definitions in nascent areas and can serve to govern interactions across complex digital ecosystems. But with all good things, of course, there are uh, potentially adverse impacts. And so to what Michelle articulated as well, not all standards are equal. And specifically where I'd like to hone in is considering their development process. Standards are developed for many different actors. They can be developed by industry associations, professional societies, standard development organizations, consortia, companies, and governments. And effectively, while there are standards in use across all sectors of the Canadian economy, not all standards are developed using a formal, consistent, and reliable standards development process. It is important to understand that one development process may be, in fact, very different from the next, and how standards are developed influences whose interests they will serve. 
We certainly heard from Marta and Michelle on what I would term more as formal standards. The informal nature of standards development as well has implications on global marketplace rules. So for instance, most companies develop their own internal standards, sometimes called policies, to describe their purchasing requirements, material characteristics, and or production practices. A prime example of a company standard are those developed by General Motors. And these standards are often tested by a certification body accredited by Standards Council of Canada. The development of company standards from one company to the next may be significantly different, and the process, most usually, is not publicly available. The same is sometimes true of industry standards, often developed by industry associations. Typically, these industry association memberships comprise group of companies serving a specific industry. Some industry associations are accredited by a national standards body, like the Standards Council of Canada, and have a greater higher uh, or have a cer certainly a higher level of scrutiny applied to the standards development process. Further, national standards can be developed in Canada through standards development organizations accredited by Standards Council of Canada, to which Marta, um, Marta shared with you uh, here today. Further, many standards, and again, to what Marta described, are developed in international forms like ISO and IEC through their technical committees and subcommittees. So how you use standards can can ultimately influence marketplace behaviors. As policymakers, regulators, trade specialists here in our audience today, you have a number of policy and regulatory levers that can influence marketplace behaviors, each having the possibility of intersecting with standards. So in addition to incorporating national standards by reference to what in regulation to what Michelle had described, departments and agencies may also use standards in different ways to meet policy and regulatory objectives. As examples, departments and agencies can use uh, or, or can, can work actually with the Canadian uh, insurance industry to build underwriting practices that promote the adoption of responsible risk-reducing measures and risk-based pricing while fostering a competitive responsible insurance market by having premiums reduced for organizations complying with specific standards. Departments and agencies can provide public recognition through the development of voluntary or mandatory certification programs or seals of approval to which organizations would be assessed by an independent third party against a national standard. A good example within the public service is within innovation science and economic development with the Cyber Secure Canada program uh, that does this. Um, governments can provide tax breaks or subsidies uh, for investments made to comply with standards. Departments and agencies can also use weighted criteria for federal grant applications, i.e. those that essentially implement a standard having higher scoring to those that do not. Uh, similarly, departments and agencies can put companies voluntary, com voluntarily complying with a specific standard on a priority list to deliver services to government and even further could make that priority list publicly available to differentiate companies in the marketplace for the private sector to consider these companies for delivering products and solutions to them. A good example within the Treasury Board Secretariat is uh, having uh, pre-identified uh, AI uh, uh, companies that can serve the government on, on, on more or less a prioritized list for government departments to leverage. Uh, providing that and provided that in the open of indicating who those those parties were. Uh, having spoken to many of those companies that in fact are on that list, they've received tremendous interest from other uh, companies and countries from around the world as a result of Canada pro profiling them in such a way, even though the service hasn't actually been uh, given yet uh, to the government, but yet on that priority list. As a final example, departments and agencies can identify areas where commercial products and services are available to help companies implement standards and where the gaps exist. Departments and agencies can then communicate those gaps in research and development opportunities. So there's tremendous, uh, there's a tremendous number of levers that can be pulled where there's an intersection to standards that the public service and folks like you that are listening here today can pull on uh, to effectively move and influence marketplace behaviors. Turning more to the CIO Strategy Council now and a little bit about us, we are Canada's national forum that brings together the country's most forward-thinking chief information officers and executive tech leaders. 
uh, to collectively mobilize on common digital priorities. Cutting across major sectors of the Canadian economy, public, private, and not-for-profit, the Council harnesses the collective expertise and action of Canada's CIOs to propel Canada as a digital first nation. As we cut across these major sectors, the Council is harnessing the collective expertise and action of Canada's CIOs to propel Canada as a digital first nation. From major banks, insurance companies, telcos, energy companies, audit and assurance firms, and traditional IT providers to not-for-profits, to federal, provincial, and municipal governments, the CIO Strategy Council is harnessing the collective strength of the CIO community from across the country. With one-third of the CIO Strategy Council's membership represented by the federal family, and in this time of crisis amid a global pandemic, I am heartened by the passion, drive, and mindfulness of our members that they all share as the country's foremost technology leaders. Our members, together with customers, clients, and citizens, are all taking on enormous amounts of work to keep our economy going and all of us safe. With a strategic coordinated approach, the CIO Strategy Council, together with its members, are helping to inform the design of disruptive and emerging technologies and are addressing the most highly rated and most pressing digital policy areas to accelerate responsible technology adoption across all sectors in our Canadian economy. Taking action to result in a safer, more prosperous ICT ecosystem for Canada, one that is globally competitive and serves the well-being of Canadians. One way we are taking action is through the development of National Standards of Canada as an accredited standard development organization, solely focused on tech. While voluntary in nature, these standards are providing signals to the marketplace on the expectations of products, services, and people. Through our agile, open-by-default, consensus-based approach, the CIO Strategy Council has accelerated the standard-setting process in Canada to match the speed of innovation and advancement in ICT, developing new standards in months, not years, and making them readily available at no cost to organizations and individuals to implement. Comprised of hundreds of thought leaders and experts, from the public service to the private sector to not-for-profits, academia, and the like, cutting across various sectors of the Canadian economy from coast to coast to coast. It's the hard work of our technical committees that are leading to the publication and the development of critical standards for data governance, AI ethics, digital identity, cybersecurity, and more. We also, following unanimous support from member organizations of the Open Community of Ethics in Autonomous and Intelligent Systems, Oceanus, the CIO Strategy Council accepted the nomination to assume the responsibilities of the Secretariat in 2020. Leading the Secretariat and serving as the chair of a steering committee, the CIO Strategy Council penned the Oceania Strategic Plan and is playing a critical role in facilitating ever-important global cooperation or collaboration among standard-setting bodies around the world concerning the extraordinary challenges facing information and technology te uh, communication technology standards development fueled by the digital transformation. It's important to note that Oceanus is a body that's not developing standards itself, but is providing a forum for standard-setting bodies that are, in fact, developing standards from around the world to collectively share information and to leverage uh, work that's, that's currently underway. And as a result of us being a founding member of Oceanus, the CIO Strategy Council spearheaded the launch of the first world's the world's first centralized repository that captures AI and related technology standards work from around the world as a measure to support cooperation, collaboration, and global alignment. And so finally, to conclude, together we can better identify the blind spots and opportunities that standards create in order to advance commercialization prospects for Canadian companies on a global scale. Together we can ensure we are all moving the innovation dial forward by developing and using standards that protect critical capital like intellectual property ownership and improve freedom to operate policies. Together, we can ensure startups have the opportunity to influence and identify pra practical standard solutions that will respond to the barriers they are experiencing in the marketplace. Only together can we move from words to action and establish Canada's role in the global digital marketplace. Thank you. I will pass things back over to Martha. Thank you, Keith and Michelle, for those presentations. And if you could um, just uh, close the window uh, for sharing your presentation, that would be great. 
we're going to move on to our next section, uh, which is the discussion, uh, hopefully being able to field some of your questions from viewers. Uh, please, once again, feel free as the questions come to your mind uh, to post them in the top right of your viewing window. Uh, hopefully, I will be getting uh, a list of those uh, shortly so we can sort of use that as a launch point for a discussion. Uh, in the interim, I will sort of take a first stab at it and provide with the first question for Michelle and Keith and I to discuss. And I think it's interesting because we've all mentioned um, sort of Canada's role and, and where we see uh, the standards opportunities and some of the challenges that need to be addressed. From your um, perspective, what would be some of Canada's strengths? Like, what are we contributing? What would be the, really the value add? Maybe you know, specifically from what differentiates our regulators, our government officials, in and what would be their their unique approach in in developing standards in emerging areas? And especially, it comes to mind uh, we we've all touched upon data governance, and I think that's something that we we see as being very active in standards development right now at, at all different types of areas and organizations. Um, just your your thoughts on on what what is Canada's strengths? Okay, well, I can uh, I can start by saying that um, Canadians have a very are very well regarded internationally. We're seen as um, you know consensus. Uh, we're interested in in reaching consensus. We are not intimidating uh, because we are a mid-sized uh, economy, and yet uh, we are a knowledge-based economy. So we bring considerable expertise around the table. Um, so I, I think we're punching beyond our weight, quite frankly, internationally when it comes to uh, influencing uh, the, um, you know, what becomes the consensus around the table. I think our weakness right now is, uh, is, is probably the fact that we don't have the institutional capacity now to create a Canadian view and come in with one approach or one position that um, you know will advance our interests, whether it's our you know our regulatory agenda, the values that Canadians uh, you know believe are important to be embedded in in data governance standards, or even our trade objectives and and what we need to get out of the system. Other countries, um, large economies, Japan, South Korea, China, and now the U.S. is coming back with the Biden administration. You will see, you know, representatives from State Department and Commerce back at the uh, at the international table. They have organized themselves to come up with more coherent and well-positioned, uh, you know, arguments that reflect the country's interests. We need to do, we need to be better at that in Canada to really take advantage of the system, in my view. Thank you. Yeah, and Marta, from from my perspective, you know, with with interactions with a number of of, of departments and agencies uh, on on a on a daily basis, quite frankly, um, the public service, uh, you know, all all the folks that are even attending here today, um, have we have a tremendous talent pool uh, that can be drawn upon um, the types of like in terms of our engagement with and and as we scope out new standards work and address gaps in areas like you mentioned around data governance, there's been a significant influence and, and expertise coming from public service uh, stakeholders into our standards development activities. Um, given that there's tremendous resource, uh, tremendous resources that have been uh, pooled within the federal family to effectively address a number of the challenges that we're faced with today, um, whether it's in our transportation sector, agriculture, health, um, or even within skills uh, and the workforce, um, there's been tremendous uh, discussion and conversation amongst our council and with uh, the federal family very much represented uh, and, and having these strategic discussions around things like data governance where I really find the strength uh, of, of our Canadian economy uh, and of the people that make up our economy um, to be quite great that by effectively coming together, coalescing an ecosystem across different sectors of the Canadian economy to help collectively solve 
uh, for many of the types of challenges is something that I see as 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 a great a great strength to Canada. Uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic has just um, even um, heightened or increased the even awareness of the fact that the public, private, not for profit sectors can come together and collectively solve for a number of the challenges that are pressing and, and facing us today. And, and having the ability through something like standard setting as, as infrastructure where you're building consensus toward, you are effectively collectively solving for. So it's not just you know, uh, a public service or a regulator saying, well, this, this is what needs to fit within the market. It's effectively collectively tooling and solutioning with, with industry, consumers, academia, to solve for and build uh, effectively uh, an ecosystem that um, there is collective buy-in for. So I think from a strength perspective, I would say we have a tremendous talent pool. It's tapping into that talent and to engage in effective mechanisms like standardization uh, to be able to build consensus toward what uh, effectively would meet policy and regulatory objectives within the federal family. Those are fantastic viewpoints, and I think it was really interesting for us in the Data Governance uh, Standardization Collaborative to see um, those expression of voices and having the, the regulator representation um, and, and being able to have those types of conversations in, in the context of standards, um, I think was really enlightening and also felt really empowering to see um, how much potential we, we really have in, in bringing those stakeholders together. Um, I'm just getting a few questions here, so I'll move on to the next one. Uh, standards are clearly important for regulators, but why do standards matter for public servants doing procurement or uh, providing legal advice? I think, Keith, this is something that you had mentioned, and if you would like to elaborate, that would be great. For sure. So, uh, you know, procurement is a is a really effective tool. You consider the 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 buying power of the federal family, the, the type of signal you can send to the marketplace is quite significant um, just by virtue of, of saying we want this or we want that. Um, the connection for folks that are doing procurement are to consider a few things. One, the very process you're using up front for procurement. Currently, right now, and through uh, many partners like uh, uh, Tech Nation and their work with Shared Services Canada around this notion of a public procurement process 3.0 are re-envisioning and imagining how effectively to procure uh, new technologies in a way that is inclusive and, and open and where we can reap the benefit of many different small medium enterprises around the table, taking a much more agile challenge-based approach. Now, that's unique. There's a pilot happening through shared services, but how do we go about then taking that process and having it replicated across uh, across the country in a way where we're not operating solely in silos, but actually capitalizing on the intellectual capital that's been gained through the pilot? And this is where standards can fit and fill that void. So from a process point of view, it's one of the areas where the CIO Strategy Council is effectively developing a national standard for agile procurement around digital products and services to effectively leverage pilots like that through Shared Services Canada in a way to effectively create uh, a, a process, a way in which other organizations, whether public, private, or not-for-profit, can reap the benefits from what we've been able to uh, succeed in that type of intellectual, propital, uh, the, the intellectual capital. That is process. Now, when it comes to the actual technologies themselves, procurement, again, is a, is a very strategic tool that can be used where you can effectively signal to the marketplace on the expectation of the product or the service. So you can certainly as much as we talked about incorporating standards by reference and regulation, there is nothing stopping public servants from incorporating standards into their procurement in such a way that, again, ensures the interoperability of products and services and or ensures the safety and reliability. Um, again, it doesn't necessarily mean that the public service needs to say, okay, for this procurement contract, it needs to be that standard. But what it can do, like I talked about in terms of weighted criteria, there can be a point rated system where you're looking at various uh, ways in which the companies are approaching these things and what types of standards they're using so that it doesn't necessarily be a mandatory point, but can certainly be a point rated point where uh, you're able to get a sense of the type of assurance 
behind and confidence around the technology that in fact you're procuring. So for, for those that are putting these procurement uh, RFPs together and, and likewise those that in fact are, are assessing and evaluating them, the public servants around this table, um, they, there's a, a, a very big intersection between standards and procurement that you can leverage. That potential for optimization and streamlining, I think, that speaks to everybody that works in procurement and, and being able to, to write those specifications. Michelle, would you like to add anything? Uh, no, I think the uh, the question was also about uh, legal advice. So it's not only yes. procurement, but legal advice. I, I can tell you if there is a an international standard out there for a new product with a certification component to it, I think uh, you know um, it's it's probably a, a better um, a pathway to you know to regulate than than coming up with an entirely new process uh, and consult with Canadians on uh, and starting from scratch. Uh, we're seeing it over and over again, um, and I think the legal community appreciates uh, you know when standards uh, are being deployed and adopted especially if there's a certification component to it. Um, uh, I, I think the issue here for me, and I'm coming back to this, this whole question here, is that when uh, you know regulators are developing and maintaining regulations, um, they need to keep in mind that technologies can evolve quickly and that standards can evolve very quickly as well. Uh, I'll just give you an example that uh, you know I, I will always remember, and it's about something very mundane. It's garage door openers, right? I mean, you you remember this? Um, garage door openers are, you know, are subject to um, a, a lot of health and safety uh, constraints, uh, and there were people hacking them and people and and people being hit by them. So I remember in in a space of um, five years. Uh, the standards body responsible for that standard made 11 versions, you know, 11 new editions, well, not new editions, but new versions of that standards within a span of five years to reflect the technology as it evolved. And certification bodies were quite, you know, open to the idea of recertifying products uh, to meet those new standards so that the products could be, you know, safe and 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 could continue to evolve from a technology perspective. So. There's nothing stopping, uh, you know, standards bodies and stakeholders to con constantly evolve their, their their standards to reflect what's happening uh, when it comes to new technologies. The the other facet I'll just mention, Marta, is the the notion that we talked about standards being voluntary in nature, and uh, as much as they're voluntary, one important facet to be mindful of is that uh, as much as they're voluntary, they can be referenced in case law. So in, in the event that there is something that goes wrong, as much as we take many things for granted and we're quite naive in the fact that the economy keeps working, when something bad happens and uh, there's a lawsuit that takes place, uh, if you have a very savvy lawyer, they can point to a standard that's been developed, albeit voluntary, but because it's consensus driven, uh, can be pointed to as, as best practice. And if an organization can't demonstrate that they've done any sort of due diligence around and, and navigating the system to say, oh, you know what, I should take a look at that standard, they can be uh, heavily fined or, or otherwise. So it's another facet to be mindful of. As much as we say they're voluntary, I like to refer them as kind of quasi-mandatory because you never know when they're going to come up. Uh, and and in that way, they can they can have severe consequences uh, should should any bad thing happen that uh, doesn't stand the test of of public scrutiny or or of of customers or clients or or the like. I think it speaks to the volumes of of the power of having that consensus build and when that due process is followed, even as you said, you know it's voluntary at the end, but there's that ex already internal adoption based on the stakeholders that were involved in the development of that standard. I think um, I wanted to add, especially with the the additions and in the garage example that Michelle brought up, I think what's also uh, 
a fundamental benefit of these types of standards and development is their agility to be able to um, to respond to updates in technology and subsequently the certification aspect can grow along with that emerging technology and and as different areas or different risks are identified there is that ability to respond while still maintaining some sort of structure and i think this leads really well to this question here of how do we make standards for evolving technologies that are flexible enough to adapt to the technology but still ensures that the standard provides safety security or trade facilitation needed yeah that that's the business we're in right now. Uh, when it comes to you know Internet of Thing devices, uh, any any sort of thing around you know the way in which data is uh, consumed uh, or shared across uh, organizations, uh, all of this have have significant implications. And while at the same time, as much as there's an evolving nature to these things. Um, there is this this check and balance that still needs to happen. And if you're not in tandem developing standards, you're you're essentially creating a market that's the wild west. You're giving the ability for um, perhaps even larger firms that can can leverage their buying power or otherwise to effectively set the rules in their favor. And this is why one of the reasons I mentioned the, the public service having this buying power, uh, it's, it's a force to be reckoned uh, that, that there, is, there is significant ability here. Um, in turn, in terms of the standards we're developing, it's driving toward consensus that does do just what the question asks, providing enough safety security within the framework used, whether it's about the device itself or the product or the organization in the way that in which they uh, they go about conducting due diligence, but also providing it more performance-based where they're not locked into a specific per prescriptive way of doing business um, to enable for the innovation to still occur and that flexibility. So, you know, we're not saying it needs to be blue or red. Uh, we're saying it needs to have X uh, outcome. And by having that, you know, your, the way in which organizations can innovate to achieve those types of outcomes is where we move into more performance-based type uh, standards that can move and continuously improve upon uh, moving forward. And then as things continue to get established, further codifying accordingly and building that consensus. Yeah, and, and the issue for me is with regulators, it's, it's a plea for regulators to get engaged into the system and, and, and adopt the incorporation method as amended from time to time so that you don't uh, inadvertently create a barrier to trade by not uh, refer referring to the latest version of a document that is probably better equipped to, to protect health and safety than previous versions. So. You know, throw the static references out and uh, adopt as amended from time to time and come and play with the others so that uh, you're confident that the latest version meets your policy needs. Absolutely. We, um, I see this very often in JTC1, um, in, for example, the Committee for Artificial Intelligence. And of course, it's a very dynamic sector and um, there's an ebb and flow in, in the advancement of R&D um, as well as uh, regulatory approaches. And I think it's it's been really great to see Canadians engage with, with other countries' delegations and, and being able to understand where their perspectives lie um, and what are the opportunities for harmonization that can already start being built into that standards development process. So at the end of the day, when the standard is published, it's not then an exercise in harmonization and adoption, but that conversation really begins within the standards development. Um, and I think this is absolutely, I think the plea is for, from all three of us uh, around participating and really gaining that awareness of the landscape of the sector, of the topic that you're looking at. Um, there are standards, I would assume, in every single one uh, that you can imagine. Um, and so there's definitely something for everyone, uh, not only to to reference, to to look into, but then also to to jump on board in, in the gaps that you know you may identify from your perspective, from your needs, um, to understand where the opportunities to to engage in that uh, initiative that might be underway, or to to propose a new standard. These are the types of of, of hopefully inspiring uh, opportunities that lie ahead. Uh, I wanted to just provide some concluding remarks. 
Um, I think we we all agree about the intrinsic value and strategic role uh, tool that standards are from this perspective of innovation. We spent a lot of time on that, but of course on trade as well. Um, it's an active and dynamic landscape. All of us have uh, a sort of a, a finger on the pulse and uh, we're really happy to share this type of updates with you. Um, and I will uh, pass on to, to Martha now to, to conclude the series. Thank you, Marta and Keith and Michelle for a fantastic discussion today. And thank you to the audience for joining us and asking such insightful questions. On behalf of the Canada School of Public Service and CG, uh, thank you again. La prochaine activité de la série sur les nouveaux enjeux économiques aura lieu le 12 janvier. Elle portera sur l'identité numérique ainsi que les possibilités et les défis qui y sont associés. Avec ça, bonne journée.